First of all, um, thank you all for coming. Welcome to our first Parent Happy Hour, sponsored by St. Jude Parish um, Shared Learning Series. We have four very exciting um, events coming this year. This is the first, and we uh, welcome Michelle Baker from the Antioch Group for Virtues-Based Discipline. So next month, we should have double this room for Father Hennigan before he leaves. Um, Father, <laughs> he will be presenting on defending the faith with adults and kids. So that's November second. So you can put that in your calendar right now because you guys all have your iPhones out, I'm sure. Um, that's November second, and then February eighth will be on contemporary moral issues, and April fifth of two thousand seventeen will be the, um, on spiritual life and our prayer life. So just a little bit of background on how this came about. Um, as you know, the parish is um, really reigniting the fire in all of these different um, ministries and just coming together. And uh, so uh, between CCD and the school, it's very important that we have ongoing parent formation and parent learning. And we really wanted to uh, come together and learn together. And the, um, the easiest way to do that was Wednesday nights, just during the CCD time so that um, the CCD parents would have the same opportunity. <laughs> Um, and, and bring in speakers that really help us um, in our vocations. Um, not only our first vocation to pray um, and our spiritual life, but as well as the very tough uh, vocation of parenting. Um, because the school and CCD is, we're here to support you. Oftentimes we kind of get mixed up and the school and CCD thinks, oh my gosh, we have this huge responsibility to raise all these kids. No, we're supporting you. You are the first formators of, of your children. Um, and so this is one way that we can help support you in your very exalted vocation. Um, and so tonight, we'd like to welcome Michelle Baker. She is our first speaker for our Parent Happy Hours. And she will be speaking on the virtues, um, how that relates to raising our kids in the 21st century. And um, Michelle comes from a background, she has great authority, just as a mom of six kids. I think that's amazing right there. I came from a family of 11, and my parents are saints, but Michelle is a um, mother of six. Uh, she completed her Master's of Arts degree in Human Development Counseling from Bradley University. She's a licensed clinical professional counselor and a certified alcohol and drug abuse counselor and nationally certified counselor. She specializes in treatment from children uh, with children from birth to 18 years old and their families. Uh, she works with the uh, Antioch Group, and her prior experience includes working with substance abuse treating facility. Uh, she works with domestic violence um, and a, in a foster care setting, as well as working with victims of sexual abuse. Uh, she and her husband are parishioners of St. Anne's Catholic Church. Uh, they also attend St. Phil's, and four of her children attend St. Phil's in the grade school. You have one four-year-old, I heard him on the phone the other day as we were speaking, and one at PND, a sophomore at PND. Um, so I am personally so very excited for this evening, and um, I believe ongoing learning formation is for all of us, not just nerdy Dominicans like ourselves. Um, so I thank you for taking time out of your very busy lives to come um, and learn more together. I think it's going to be a, an excellent evening of learning with one another. And so please uh, help me join. Help me welcome um, Michelle Baker with a warm St. Jude welcome. Um, good evening, and thank you for having me. This has got to be one of my favorite topics to talk about, um, parenting. Um, not only because um, I have six kids of my own, and so parenting is never in my house a black and white thing. <laughs> Right? When I went to get my master's degree, I got books that told me about theories and how to deal with anxiety and how to deal with depression and how to deal with substance abuse. But when I had my first child, I didn't get a book with a detailed how to, page 55, this is what you do when your child does this. So there's a lot of gray area when it comes to talking about not only just virtues in parenting, but parenting in general. And it's a lot to cover, so I'll try to be timely about it. Um, if you have any questions or any comments, I welcome them during. Um, I like to talk about these things, so again, please feel free to ask any questions, and I want to make sure that you get the information 
that you were hoping to get from being here um, tonight? <laughs> I am not very technology savvy. I'm just going to tell you. Tap. Yeah, don't. There's another arrow on the for that sign. Yeah, we'll just use the arrows. Um, 100 years from now, it won't matter what kind of car I drove, what kind of house I lived in, how much money I had in the bank, but the world may be a little better if I made a difference in the life of a child. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen this poem before, but it's a priorities poem, um, a poem, and it sits in my office and in my home. And it's a constant reminder for me as a parent and a counselor of the priorities of raising a child, right? Um, we live in a, in, in a time where material things are very important. I see it all the time with kids with instant gratification and things that they want and things that they need to have, right? Um, a disconnect maybe from some emotions. And this is a reminder that we have priorities in our life. In my house, our priorities, our first priority obviously is God, right? And, and being good Christian and raising good Christian children. And then my goal for my children is to give them enough tools to, when they leave my house, when they leave my home, to be able to function on their own, okay? I want to give them a toolbox so they have those skills to cope with the struggles and the, the things that they need to do as they get older. Um, and I want them to be happy. I want them to be happy children, and I want them to feel loved. So today, we're going to talk about, and I promise I'll be done before eight. Um, but I want to talk about, discuss virtues and reinforcing those virtues at home. How can we do that? You guys have a great program here that I'll talk about in a minute. The Disciples of Christ, right? Those are the virtues that um, they teach in the school. Is it every week or every month? Is it a different virtue? Yes? Okay. Um, and so we'll talk about that. We're going to talk the concept of helicopter parenting and how it can be a barrier to practicing virtues. I can tell you how to teach the virtues um, in your home, but I also need to tell you what gets in the way of teaching those virtues and your children practicing those virtues at home. Passive parenting, which is the opposite of the helicopter parenting. Resources for parents, importance of prayer in parenting. Virtues-based discipline. Um, using common sense in parenting. I'm a counselor. I read a lot of self-help books. I go to the store and, and I get a lot of information, right? Sometimes it's too much information, right? We're trying to decide, well, I read this book about worried children or I read this book about something else. And sometimes in parenting, it just takes a little common sense. Stopping and thinking, we encourage our kids to stop, think, and act. As parents, that gray area, a little common sense in parenting. And a balance, right? We live in a very busy world. I have six kids. They only are involved in one activity each. And we are busy all the time. So learning how to have a balance in life is also really important. Um, if you look at your handouts, this is all in your handout. And I have to apologize, I probably should have handed out magnified glasses along with your handouts, okay? Because um, I am technology challenged, and I have to admit, my husband actually helped me with the PowerPoint part of this. And he was not home today when I went to go print this out, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is really small. So I apologize that I did not hand out uh, magnifying glasses for you. Some definitions. Character, one of the attributes or features that make up a distinguished individual. I have six children, five of which are boys. Each of my children, I know my poor daughter. Don't feel sorry for her, she can handle herself. Um, she's the second to youngest and she'll never have a date. So, um, they are different characters. I cannot parent every single one of my children the same way because they have different personalities and different characters. A parent, a person who is a mother or father, the act of a mother or father, or virtue, behavior showing high moral standards. <coughs> this I got straight off your website of Disciples of Christ. And these are not all of the ones they teach here in the school, but it is some of them. Um, and we're gonna talk 
a little bit about um, these in a few minutes. Um, what I like about the website as I was reading it and going over it is the examples that you give in school, um, the examples that they give to the children, um, is that they talk about what it looks like to a kid and what it sounds like to a child. And that's really important. They need to have those examples. They need to know when I'm interacting with my friend, this is what kindness looks like, right? When I'm respecting boundaries, this is what it looks like. The only thing that I would, would add as a counselor is then what does that feel like? When you show compassion, because one of the things that we do in my office when I'm working with children and we're working with social skills is we try to get them to tap into what that feels like. When you feel compassion, towards another human being, what does that feel like? Because as you all know, we have a problem with bullying in the schools, right? I don't know about St. Jude, but in some of the other schools that we go to, we have problems with bullying. And part of that is because kids have a real disconnect with that empathy part that they feel for another person. Um, and so getting them to also recognize what does patience feel like? That calmness of having to wait for something before you get it. Okay, and having to identify so when they're in my office and we're working on these virtues or those social skills, not only do we talk about what it sounds like and what it looks like, we also talk about what it feels like. Okay, I briefly want to talk about the helicopter parent. And the helicopter parent, parent has actually been around for a while. It used to be called like the protective parent. Um, and, and the issue is, is that it's becoming a little more prevalent. Um, and it truly does get in the way of teaching your children's virtues, okay? So the helicopter parent first used in 1967 in a book called Parents and Teenagers to describe parents who hover over their children. It became a dictionary entry in 2001. And then a woman named Ann Dunwall, PhD, and she wrote a book, um, and the title just kind of makes me laugh, called Even June Cleaver Would Forget the Juice Box. <laughs> So it's a great book about how we're not perfect parents. And she described it as overparenting, meaning being in a child's life that is over-controlling, over-protecting, and over-perfecting in a way that is in excess of responsible parenting. We all want to protect our children. We all want our children to succeed, right? I do. I want my kids to, to succeed. I have the ability to be a helicopter parent. I think the worst invention for me, and I probably needed a 12-step program, was the, the where I could check my kids' grades every day. <laughs> oh, that is a horrible, horrible program for me. <laughs> horrible. I took, um, sister mentioned I have a sophomore at PND, and he isn't always the most motivated to turn in his homework, right? And when you're paying school tuition, it's kind of important to get good grades, right, at school, and you want them to do well. And so last year was his first year, and he was getting adjusted to the, to the high school. And I decided that I was not at all happy with, with his grades. And so I decided that I was going to take it upon myself to babysit him with these grades. And I spent a lot of long hours checking. Like, at first, I didn't even sign up for the for the whole parent check the thing. And then I, I signed up, that's a bad idea, just a bad idea. <laughs> and so then it was daily. I was checking these grades like every day. And then as soon as he walked in the door from practice, I was like, what? Why'd you miss like two of those things on that assignment? Or, or hey, wait a minute, that's a day late. And our whole relationship was based on me checking those grades all the time. And it became ever consuming in our house all the time that I spent long hours, literally the last trimester, sitting next to him to make sure he wouldn't venture off to like a different website. And he was working all the time. That was obsessive. And I knew it was becoming obsessive because I felt it coming obsessive. It was the more internally I felt out of control, the more <laughs> externally I wanted to control his environment to make sure that he succeeded. The problem is, is it backfired, right? He didn't do any better. Our relationship was horrible. Um, I spent late nights sitting next to him, waiting for him to get his homework done, right? And my other five children suffered in the process, okay? I wanted him to do well. 
not just because I wanted him to do well, but my other fear was, and this goes along with helicopter parenting, is I was afraid that people would think I was a bad parent if my kid didn't turn in his homework, right? Oh, that parent's not responsible. He has three missing assignments, right? And it no longer became about him. It became about me, which often happens in helicopter parenting, right? We want our children to play sports. We want them to do well, right? But sometimes our own wishes get in the way of healthy parenting. Selecting the child's teacher, right? I can't tell you how many parents come in my office that are really upset because they got the wrong teacher or the child isn't where they're supposed to be or the coaches, they're not on the right team, right? <laughs> my husband coaches JFL, a flag, and just recently we had a, a grandparent, actually. He had, it was from a different team. The grandma was extremely mad as a seven-year-old because her grandson didn't play running back every single play. He was made to play running back and he should play running back every single time. At the end of the last game, the little boy refused to shake the hands of the other team. So his coach said, I'm sorry, not my husband, he wasn't his coach at the time, said you won't play the first two periods of the next game. We practice good sportsmanship and you need to shake the hands of the other players. Well, the grandma was very upset. She went up the chain of command, and what ended up happening is in, she wanted all the coaches fired, and <laughs> all the coaches kicked out of the league, right? And you laugh that this happens so frequently. Um, and he got moved to another team because the people above didn't want to kind of cope with it. And what happens is, is that that kid becomes unteachable. He becomes uncoachable, and he gets the message that all that has to happen is somebody has to protect me. I don't have to suffer any consequences, right? And it happens all the time. We don't want to see our kids sad. We don't want them to have to have them fail, right? The participation trophies, the whole thing. Okay. <coughs> this is my cartoon. It says, last but not least, my child to seat by the window so I can see her on my drone camera. <laughs> right? We get so afraid, right? I remember when my first child was born, my husband literally bubble wrapped the whole house. We had like piping and whatever because he didn't want our son to get to get hurt. Okay, why? Fear of dire consequences. Fear of a low grade, not making a team, fear of struggling. I talked about that. Feelings of anxiety or worried um, about the future. If I don't help my child along, right, if I don't do their homework for them or they don't get a really great grade on that project, they're never going to get into college. They're never going to get into the right high school. They're never going to be in those AP classes if I don't do everything for them and help them out. I can't tell you how many times parents have done homework assignments and said, you know, I just did it for them, Michelle. <coughs> <laughs> um, open overcompensation, not having their own needs met as a child, fear of history repeating itself, so um, maybe they didn't get their needs met as a child or they weren't nurtured or whatever, and so they're going to make up for it by doing everything for their, their, their child now. Peer pressure from other parents, guilt that we see other parents overly involved, and we are the bad parent, the fear of failing. Social media is great for this, right? We were just talking about this. My kids go to St. Phil's, and I happened to be in the office with the secretaries, and we were, we were kind of talking about social media and how Susie's mom made the best casserole ever, and she posted it there while she was taking all the kids to soccer practice and doing all of these things. And they compare themselves to each other, and as a result, we have a fear of failure. And then we run around trying to measure up to the other parents um, in our area, right? Or at our school, our friends. We, we text our friends, we talk to our friends, we get their validation, yeah, yeah, yeah. We need to be doing this, you need to be doing more of that. Your kids should be playing travel soccer. You should be in 12 dance classes a week, right? And we listen and we see what other people are doing and we start comparing ourselves and thinking we should be doing that too. It's that whole keep up with the Joneses idea. Instead of practicing humility, what I'm seeing a lot of is, Johnny got the new iPhone 7, 
and therefore I should get the new iPhone 7. Well, he got a trophy at the last soccer tournament. I should have gotten that trophy. Instead of saying to his friend, right, or her friend, hey, that was a really nice job. That was a really nice job. You did a great job. It's more of a competitive nature where I now have to do one better than you. The effects. Decreased confidence and self-esteem. What did I tell my son last year in, in, in my behavior by not letting him ever do anything? <coughs> is that you can't handle this. You can't handle it without my help, so I'm going to do it for you. Right? We see that all the time. And it's age appropriate. You know, I talk about my 15-year-old son, but my three and almost four-year-old son empties the dishwasher. Right? He has tasks and things, not knives. Don't worry. <laughs> no knives. Um, tasks so that he can build that self-confidence. Would it be easier if I just let it myself? Absolutely, right? Or when they want to mix the pancake batter, would it be just easier if I did it myself? <laughs> yes, it also would keep my kitchen a lot cleaner too, right? Because it wouldn't be all over the place. But those are tasks as young children that they should be able to do. When we talk about helicopter, uh, sorry, helicopter parenting and that fine line, it's that fine line between you know, doing too much for your child and what they are emotionally and age appropriately able to do, right? They should be doing age appropriate tasks for all ages to build confidence and, and to build perseverance. <laughs> Undeveloped coping skills. Unable to deal with day-to-day -day stressors that are a part of life, disappointment, loss, and failure. This is huge in my business right now. I have been practicing therapy for 23 years, and I don't know that I have ever seen as much anxiety walk in my door in children as young as six and seven, worried about failure, worried about what to do next, worried can I handle this, my best friend doesn't want to be my friend anymore, I can't handle that anymore, right? It is huge, it's the underdeveloped coping skills that they can't, because we're so busy trying to make it okay, and, and we don't want to see our kids feel sad, we run the risk of them not having the coping skills. They just did a recent study, um, because the helicopter kids are now growing up to get into college, <coughs> that they're finding out that those kids are now coming home from college, right? Because parents have done all of this stuff all the way through high school, they've taken care of everything, they haven't given them age-appropriate tasks, they're coming home from high school because, or college because they no longer can handle the stress of college. They have a disappointment, they have a fear, they have something happen, and they need to come home. So we're finding more and more kids come back home because they can't handle life stressors. Um, it increases anxiety and depression, sense of entitlement, instant gratification, Social lives always adjusted by their parents allows them to believe that they can always have it their way. The little kid in the store who's four that throws a tantrum because he can't have the cookie, it's easier if I just give him a cookie because then I don't, nobody's going to be looking at me at the store while I'm shopping. You should come shopping with me. Somebody's always throwing a tantrum in my cart, right? Or pulling something over the off the shelves, right? We just, we allow them to continue that behavior because it's just easier and it doesn't make us look bad. And then underdeveloped life skills. Um, prevents kids from learning skills on their own. <clears throat> underdeveloped virtues, the lack of ability to identify or demonstrate virtues. We're going to talk about that today. Um, Science Today also reports that with this type of parenting, conditional love is based on performance. I just read an article yesterday that indicated Parents are withholding love and affection as a result of their achievements. It's becoming more and more frequent. You don't come home with an A, you don't be the top dog on your soccer team, and I'm going to be angry at you. It's happening more and more where parents withhold that affection as a result of them not achieving what they need to achieve. And then the difference between intrinsic and versus intrinsic extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation. When I was helping my son with homework, right? I wanted him, I was the external motivator, right? But what I really needed to have was it to come from within him. Because I'm not going to be with him as he grows up, right? It has to be able to come from within to make a significant change. 
I have a 10 year old son too, and, and most people would love to have Matthew, and I, I'd love to have Matthew. Um, and he is very anxiety based. And in kindergarten, he got greens all the time. He got greens. He, you know, the red, yellow. Do you guys use red, yellow, green here? The green, yellow, red, the behavior chart. Okay, so just know green was good. And he got green every single day, right? I have to get green, I have to get green. One day he came home with a red. Out of just, it was just crazy. He came home with your red. And my husband and I were so excited internally. <laughs> I don't think, don't ask me about my other children, okay? Because they tip the scale the other direction. We would like to see more greens. But he came home with a red. And we internally, we didn't tell him at all. We were really excited he got a red because he had this expectation of himself. He had to be perfect all the time. He had to be like this great kid that could never make a mistake. And we were happy because we wanted him to know that despite making mistakes, you will survive. And you will be okay. And you can make the changes. Um, it was so out of character for him too. Um, make the necessary changes. He's the same kid that doesn't like to get a B, so we're pretty excited sometimes. He gets a B too. <laughs> I know, is that weird for a parent to say? <laughs> so this is how helicopter parenting ties into um, virtues. And it's along with passive parenting too. The passive parents who never set any limits and boundaries. I think they call it permissive parenting now. But they don't ever set any limits or boundaries. They kind of let the children do what they want to do. Right? And as a result, boundaries and structure are excellent for children because it gives them a message that they're safe and somebody is providing for them in, in, in a structured manner. Not over the top where they're doing everything for them. But boundaries are really important. So with mistakes and failure, right, do we not gain perseverance and industriousness? Right? If I don't ever fail, then I never gain that perseverance to work a little harder or the problem solving skills to change things. I have to fail to gain some of that. Yeah, I can tell you about it. I can show it to you and other people, but there is a true benefit to experiencing it yourself. I played, I played college ball, softball, and, and I did better because my parents weren't involved in that kind of thing. My dad wasn't allowed to, he made girls cry. So, um, so he wasn't involved, but there was, at every loss or every strikeout or everything I didn't do well, there was a desire to do better. With instant gratification, do we not fail to grow patience? If I give you everything that you want, do I ever have to wait? Do I ever have to experience that calm feeling of waiting for, for that reward, right? Take kids to the fall festival somewhere and teach them patience. Give them 10 tickets and then tell them that's all you have for an hour. <laughs> Come back and see me in an hour. It's a true test of patience. Or get on the phone with sister and say, hey, can you wait till I'm done? And have a four-year-old screaming. <laughs> right? I was like, shoot, she's not going to want to hear me talk. <laughs> um, if children have a sense of entitlement, where do they learn gratitude and humility? Right? How do we learn about being grateful for the things we have if we are paved and given everything all the time? If my parents hand me everything I want because that's what's in and we see it all the time, how do I understand what gratitude and humility feels like? How do I recognize that? If I don't feel sadness or disappointment, then we'll miss compassion and kindness to others. Right? If I don't feel sadness and understand compassion, how do I recognize when I need to give it to somebody else? When that child's being made fun of on the playground, or somebody got their feelings hurt, how do I express that compassion if I don't know what it feels like to receive it? And if children do not have structures and boundaries, how do they learn respect? Right, to respect adults, right? If, if a parent is bailing out a child every time they get in trouble at school, and it suddenly becomes the teacher's fault without getting all of the facts, how does that child ever learn respect, right? Or self-control, to control what they say and what they do. That that type of behavior has consequences. There is 
again, you can say it, you can read about it, but there is great benefit to experiencing it. Uh, has anybody ever seen the Michael Jordan poster? It's my absolute favorite. I had a bad year one year in counseling, and one of my somebody left it an, like anonymously for me one day. It was the greatest. It was a God thing. I'm convinced. I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I failed over and over again in my life, and that is why I succeed. And that is the message we need to kind of share with our kids. All right, virtue-based discipline. So let's see here. If you look, so I have a short list of biblical virtues in your packet. This will be very good. I'm putting an advertisement in for Father's Talk. He's talking scripture next month. Yes, correct, sister. And so you might want to look some of these up, maybe extra brownie points for the talk <laughs> next month if you have some of these. So I put those in because obviously we are not going to cover every um, virtue today. So virtue-based discipline. Recognize teachable moments, both validating and correcting. Sometimes I don't always see the fruits of um what my husband and I teach, and by the way, my husband is way calmer than I am. And we don't always see the fruits of what we teach at home unless it's those unexpected moments, right? So the other day, I have five boys and one girl, so just imagine five boys in a house. They're very physical. I have no living room furniture because it tends to be the wrestling room, and I'm convinced, and I've told them, when they're all out of my house, I'm going to redo the whole thing. It's the only safe way, right? <laughs> so they're all fighting and arguing about something ridiculous, which is, which is typical. And um, Kenneth, my four-year-old, is working on his alphabet and identifying. And we gave him a little incentive plan, right? This is the fruits of our labor. And my kids come up to me. And they're like, Mom, it's like the other three of the high schooler was gone. We need to talk to you. Talk to me about what? We feel that Kenny has adequately deserved his reward for learning his alphabet. We have worked with him and we have established they lawyered up, that's what they did. <laughs> so, so on a normal day, right, they would be fighting and arguing and whatever, and every once in a while you catch them come in, right, and demonstrate that kindness to each other, because it is not unusual for my husband and I, probably about 8.30 at night, this is actually getting close to my bedtime, um, <laughs> exhausted, going, what are we doing wrong as parents? Like, how come they just can't be nice to each other, right? And then they will surprise us and do this kind and gentle thing. A little boy took advantage of my little Johnny. He's probably the one that needs the most help in terms of perseverance. And um, Pokemon cards, does your school play with Pokemon cards? Um, it's huge over at St. Bill's. And a little boy traded my son Johnny for two cards that I guess were really good. I know nothing about this. And Matt was very upset. His older brother said, look, this boy took advantage of him and went with Johnny to talk to this other boy. So as much as they're like really hard on each other internally in the house, there are fruits to what we teach them about virtues if you find those teachable moments, right? And sometimes those teachable moments in our house is like 10 to 20 times a day, you know, if we're watching, right? Both positive and negative, right? We validate when they do something that's really kind or humble or compassionate, right? Or if they've struggled with something that they need to persevere, we acknowledge that. And if there's times when it's not the case, we do that as well. We talk about name the actor, act not the actor. And if you look at your handout, you have a page that says use virtues to acknowledge. Name the act, not the actor. <clears throat> so we just want to make sure um, that it that we're talking about the behavior. The behavior will motivate them more than them as a person if it makes it about them. 
So that was a kind thing to do. And, and typically, I'm even more specific. When they lawyered up, I said, wow, you know, that was really kind that all of you came to help out your brother or, or defend your brother, right? Hopefully one of them will be a lawyer when they grow up and that will continue. I really respect the way you serve others or how gentle and, and kind if you use something, right? That's that self-control. Inappropriate virtues acknowledgement. You're such a kind person. You are always serving other people. You were gentle. What a good girl. So we talked about name the act and the virtue required. Um, on the side, it talks about how we use virtues to correct. I have a question. So what's inappropriate about virtues acknowledgement on the bottom versus the on the top? So on the bottom, you're talking about them as a person, and, and we wanted to acknowledge the behavior that they're doing, the act that they're doing, not them as a, as a person, because then when you acknowledge as a person, it can become more shaming when they do something wrong. When we're talking about, because you're not a good person or a bad person, it was the behavior that was the problem, right? Or the behavior that was good. And that's what we want them to acknowledge. My act, the act that I am doing, was a positive thing to do so that in the future they recognize that that's something else that they're gonna do again. Um, use virtues to correct. You may not be a kind of Sharon, please play peacefully now. Um, what would help you to be peaceful with your anger? Versus the shaming, you're never, why can't you ever be kind? It's more belittling. So the next page is the virtues discipline. The five steps for extreme situations. Stop the behavior. Name a specific virtue that is missing. Explain briefly how this is wrong. Immediately give a consequence. And then encourage the child to make reparation. Now I do it a little differently. With my older kids, I ask them what virtue is missing. Right? What do we think we could have done differently? You know, what would have been a better like a virtue to use in that particular case, if they're having problems with their friends, right? Like courage or perseverance or self-control. I will ask them first, and if then they don't recognize it, then I will um, oftentimes acknowledge it for them. And that, for the virtues, these are for extreme behaviors, right? Where a consequence is in order, um, Maybe if one of my children are physically hurting the other one or doing something that they're not supposed to do that's more extreme than just maybe being unkind. So on the next page, you'll see asking cup emptying questions. And we like to get to the bottom of what's really going on sometimes of, of some buddies or group's behavior. And, for this particular issue, they're kind of talking about bullying at Sunday school, and this kid was making fun of this other child, and the teacher is asking cup emptying questions, meaning kind of these open-ended questions to get to the bottom of what's going on, right? You can also do what's called a vertical arrow, and what a vertical arrow is, is asking questions to get to the root of the problem, right? So like, I'm afraid to get an F on a paper. And then we'll say, and then what? What happens if you get an F? And then they tell us what happens if they get an F. And we continue to go down that list until we get an answer that, that kind of we're looking for. So that's the real fear or the real thing that's behind why they're feeling what they're feeling. And then the reflection questions, right? As a teacher or a parent, he was upset, he was embarrassed, it seems like um, pretty embarrassing when Jimmy yells. What might give you the courage to deal with that? Right? What might give you those 
coping skills to deal with feeling embarrassed. Lead by example. Um, it's really important for us to practice the virtues as well for our kids to see what we're doing, right? One of the things that we do as a family is we do the uh, neighborhood house soup kitchen. Um, once every eight weeks, neighborhood house has a rotation. And so my two older, my younger children are not quite ready to go, um, but they go down and they, they serve the homeless, right? And so that's firsthand an act of compassion and something that we do together as a family. Um, the other thing that we do as, as a family, typically, especially in the winter, is has anybody ever been to the Princeville sisters? They're with the Brothers of St. John out in Princeville, anyone? Have you been to the Children's Adoration? It is a beautiful thing if you've never had it. Um, you have to get on the sign-up list because sometimes, I think it's once or twice a month. Yes, yeah, sometimes it's twice, sometimes it's once. But I probably had the most humbling experience with the sisters. So as a helicopter parent, which I'm so good at doing, we went for our very first time to see the sisters. And as the mom who didn't want to be embarrassed in front of the sisters, I spent the first, and if you've never been there, it's like out in the middle of nowhere, like nowhere. I'm never allowed to go because I'm directionally challenged and my husband is concerned I'll end up in the cornfield. So we go out there and I have a wool ride. My husband just laughs. Um, I spend telling my children, okay, these are the sisters. You have to be like super reverent, and I don't want to see anybody trying to go get the host or pulling Jesus out of the tabernacle. I don't want to see anybody on the little stage. Don't grab it. I just went on and on for like 45 minutes. So they take the kids over to this little room to do crafts. And, and so I'm like, time my husband saves time. I'm like, this is not a good idea. We should not send those kids by themselves <laughs> over there without parental supervision because we're going to get kicked out of the Catholic Church. And so, so my husband's like, Michelle, it's going to be fine. The sisters know what they're doing. Nope. They have never met my kids, right? <laughs> Just once, never met my kids. So they go and they come back all in one piece. The sisters were all in one piece, too. Impressive. And so... They come back and they sit down and I, our little one wasn't able to go. So he was with us in the Adoration Chapel and he's kind of walking around and he's talking to people and I'm going, shh, 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 Bethany, Reverend, shh, shh, shh. And this really nice sister, bless her heart, comes up to me and she puts her hand on me and she says, this is not your adoration. And I said, what? <laughs> and she said, this isn't your adoration. This is children's adoration, and Jesus loves them, and he's not doing anything wrong, so let him be. And I was like, oh. <laughs> when a sister tells you, you're just like, oh, that hurts, right? <laughs> and so then I was fine every other time of adoration. They let them ring the bell as loud as they can. They hang off of it. They just ring. They're not like, oh my gosh, this is so embarrassing. So, virtues, if we protect our kids all the time, give them what they want, protect them from struggling a little, do we not limit the opportunity for them to not only learn about virtues, but prevent them from practicing and demonstrating those virtues? And this is like my favorite one. So, prayer is really big in our house. Um, we pray all the time. In fact, I forgot to pray last night, and my little four-year-old was like, um, you're forgetting something. <laughs> and I was like, he uses the grace, the blessed soul, Lord, that's his prayer every night. It's hilarious. But he's like, okay, okay, you say this now, Mom. And he told me what to pray for. And so, but this is a prayer that I pray for a, a lot. Because I have six kids, five of which are boys, and they should, we're lucky we haven't been in the ER more frequently. But... Have no anxiety at all, but in everything by prayer and petition. With thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. Then the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And I think as a parent, we are naturally wired to worry about our children. And sometimes we have to give up the self-help books, the social media, even our friends, 
and just spend some quiet time in prayer to get the answers that we're looking for. You know, when I am really struggling as a parent, and I do, because it's a journey, right? Every day in my house is a journey. I look to prayer and praying with my family and just on my own to really look for the answers that I need. And so the other thing I'll tell you about that goes along with prayer, being with the sisters, my kids are totally different when they leave that adoration chapel. There's something truly special about being in the presence of Jesus when they leave. They are calmer. They are nice. It doesn't last more than maybe a week, so we got to go back. <laughs> But they are different children when they pray and when they have a relationship with God. And, and we can read all the self-help books that we want and have all the guidance, but that's who in my office gives me guidance. If I have a tough case coming in, like, I look to God for the answers. I prayed for patience 16 years ago. Don't pray for patience. <laughs> because I have five boys and one girl, and I'm convinced that's how I am with five boys. <laughs> I keep asking God, like, there was no other way, like, to teach me things. <laughs> Any questions? Oh, the last is my information. Um, my uh, information for the Antioch group. If you need anything. Any questions? So the more the consequences of permissive or passive parenting is kids don't follow the rules, right? So not only do you have entitled kids in helicopter parenting, but also in um, passive or permissive parenting, there's more children with that lack of respect. So they have this opinion that they have, can be on an equal playing field with authority figures, and we see that a lot in my office. I get young adults who either are rescued or parents don't um, provide limits and boundaries and kind of let them do their own thing, where we really struggle with rules. They have problems with authority figures, self-control, managing their emotions, very angry. They have difficulty like self-regulating their feelings um, because they haven't been in a position to have to do that, right? They've kind of been allowed to express their emotions any way they would like without any type of consequences and as a result, we're dealing with then an anger management problem or high levels of anxiety or we can't get them to, to follow rules or, or listen, right? Because they're doing the things that they choose to do because there's never been any consequences, right? And there's a whole thing about permissive parenting and they say kind of the benefits of permissive parenting and like allowing them to make their own decisions. You can, I mentioned the word balance at the beginning you very much can be a protective, nurturing, loving parent who sets limits and boundaries and still allows your child to have some choices in life. I don't make all the choices for my children, but they do know that, that they have consequences for unhealthy choices that they make that are not beneficial, right? They're going to have to have some boundaries. We can't function in a house without boundaries and limits. And so the permissive parents are the ones that allow kids to do what they want and don't have any consequences or structure for them, and then we end up with a lack of self-control. Um, I'm just curious, like, how... I'm just going to use you as an example since you're the one speaking, but, like, in your household... So I have, I have three boys and two girls, and so, like, the evening hours, particularly the, between the 3 to 5 or 3 to 6, is when it's most intense, which I think is probably the case for all of us. Okay. And um, like today is an example. My, my boys are upstairs and they were goofing off or whatever. And then like my, my five-year-old yells down, Mom, Stephen said I was stupid. And I said I was a dummy. And I was like, okay. And I still like, and then he was like, Mom, what are you going to do about that? And then he comes downstairs and he specifically is like, I'm coming down here so that you can deal with it. <laughs> and I mean, my reaction was just like, I don't always want to deal with it. You know, I mean, and, and I, sometimes I wonder like, okay, I 
I tend to be more of a hands off, not not totally hands off, because I I I can sometimes be that helicopter parent, but like when you've got three boys ranging five to one, like and they're upstairs all together, my reaction is just... It's taking time off. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. Yeah, so like, for me, it's, it is. It's like that three to five hour where there's just chaos constantly. I mean, how important is it to step in or to just like, you know, deal with it yourself, kid? <laughs> we, it depends situation to situation. I must have been at your house today between three and five. <laughs> Actually, it was in our van on our way to gymnastics. They were, Mom, Mom, so and so called me a name. I, I know. We're good. But I do, in those circumstances, I probably let them handle it themselves. And then when we're as a family, right, either we're praying or we're talking, we talk about being kind to our siblings and what does that look like. And hey, you know, when you call your siblings' names, right, after school, that isn't so kind. And, and we talk about that behavior after school. But I do my, what I would call selective hearing at my house. Um, because nine times out of 10, and all three of them probably were calling each other names. And at the end of the day, like that one just happened to be the one that got to go down the stairs first, right? That you just beat them in the staircase. So in, in, I typically allow my kids to handle those situations on their own. My husband, when my first son was born, he like was everywhere. He was like that helicopter physical air park. They could walk down the stairs. And now all you hear my husband say is, are you bleeding? <laughs> if you're not bleeding, don't come and find me, okay? Because like typically it, it does go back and forth. So for that kind of stuff, I don't um, typically address or I'll say, you guys need to work it out yourself. You guys can figure this out. You need to work this out yourself. And usually after like three to five minutes it's done, they've moved on to the next drama and then doing something else. Or their best friends playing a game. So yeah. So for my, my wife and I we both work rather just the mornings and they their pests or they're knowing each other. One of them comes upstairs, same thing. You know, so and so did this. They're five and seven years old. So after around how many times of that, it was just a few months ago when I said, Okay, you're gonna come to me? You're both going to go in each other in your rooms, and you're going to be there until it's time to go to school. And, and you're not, I'm not going to get mad anymore. I'm not going to try and overthink this. If, that's what you're, if you're going to come to me with your problems, again, unless it's really big, you're going in your rooms, and you guys can play nicely in your rooms. Don't be in trouble. And so you, or you guys can work back yourselves. But if you, if you can't work back yourselves, you're going in your rooms. Two times later, my son comes up, two, I don't know, a couple days later, after me actually practicing that. He came upstairs, said, Stephen or Thomas, whatever, called me this. Or it was mean to me, whatever it was, pushed me. He said, are you saying we couldn't work it out? He put his head down and went downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> no, we can work it out. Exactly, exactly. And, and we haven't had a problem since. Yeah, you know, for my math, he does not get along with his sister very well. I. You know, Sammy's just that annoying sister that you're just so proud of, right? Like, goes in the middle of the night and beats her brother's face with toothpaste. <laughs> We're sleeping, not Sammy. And then they think that they've been, like, taken up by aliens because they wake up with a blue face the next morning and can't figure out why. And so she's that sister. And for whatever reason, her and Matthew just don't get along very well. And so a lot of times, like, where I'm on vacation, guess who's Matthew's ride partner? It's Sammy. Because I, Matthew's the older one, and I'll say, look, if you can't be kind to your sister, every ride in this park is going on with your sister. And he'll be like, I mean, that's like the instant correction. Like, oh, Sammy, you are the greatest sister ever. <laughs> right? Because he'd rather be riding with his older teenage brother than his little six-year-old sister. Right? Who pokes and screams and paints faces with toothpaste. <laughs> Any other questions? That's what I was also talking about, the common sense parenting. Sometimes it isn't about the books. You know as parents what you need to do. You don't need a Rochelle or a book or whatever to tell you how to parent. My kids are different than your kids. Well, maybe not your kids. I think you're probably <laughs> the same problem. But um, your kids are different than my kids. So sometimes it's trial and error, 
right? And I can give insight and I can give suggestions, but ultimately, as I said before, it's a journey. Parenting is a journey. And sometimes it's very much trial and error. And you just have to trust yourself and have faith. And, and if you think back to when you were kids, I think back to when I was a teenager and a child, and I turned out OK, surprisingly, baby. Um, and so, yeah, you know, I think you just have to remember those things and know and have faith. We live in a world with a lot more technology. That's a whole other subject. Um, and, and as a result, we have to do monitor some other things a little, a little more. But, you know, again, have faith and know and, and pray, and you'll do just fine as parents. Yes? What about uh, punishments and consistency? Like, we don't even remember what our punishment system is. Like, after, one day it's one thing, another day it's another thing. And we're completely inconsistent. Is that bad for the kid? And is there a rule book out there for what is a suggested point? Consistency. I will tell you, consistency is is important. Don't beat yourself up about it because I can't always say that I'm the most consistent parent. Sometimes I give in, or you know, I change my mind. Um, no, it's not necessarily good. And, and the reason is, is I tell people all the time, yeah, if you make sure if you're going to give a whopping of a consequence that you're going to follow through with what that is. Because if you draw the line in the sand um, and you continually are inconsistent, it sends the message to your child that they can break the rule and, oh, by the way, mom's going to change her mind. Right? Um, and so find something simple that works for you. Whatever the behavior is, maybe not work on like um, tons of behaviors at once. Just pick something simple. For a while, we were doing bedtime, you know, as an you would lose whatever privileges if this wasn't done. And we made it really simple because anything complex, you could go to a bookstore and get um, one to three magic. You could get um, charts with like markers and stickers. And they're all very effective, right? And they work for some people, but they're only going to work if you actually use them. Um, so my suggestion would be that you find, you talk to your spouse and you find something that works for you. The other thing is, is that you have to find something your child responds to, right? My 15-year-old responds to his social life. So he's doing really well now, and on Friday we do grade check. I don't go near those grades until Friday. And I say, on Friday I'm checking the grades. If the grades aren't where they're supposed to be, then you're grounded for the weekend. Done. It's very black and white. Whereas my other children respond to um, incentives like, their video games. We don't play a lot during the week, so they get them on the weekends, um, or going to friends' houses, um, different things. So you also have to find out what works for your child. I wish I had the magic answer. Like, I saw that look on your face, like, oh, man, <laughs> just tell me what to do. Um, but it really comes to the two of you finding what you can be consistent with and what will work, something simple. It really depends on the behavior, too. So if you want to call and email me and give me more specifics, then I can give you more specifics. Does that make sense? Yeah? Um, kind of along those lines is you have to parent each child a little bit differently. Different kids respond to different things. I have three that are really close in age. So if I do one punishment for one kid and then a different one for the next one, and she's like, that's not fair because why does Mina get to do this or, you know, so my response is, life's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a mom, I get to make the rules. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, but how, what would be an appropriate way? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that's not appropriate. <laughs> You know, um, I recognize that it's different for both of you, but 
Yeah, and they're not generally that extreme in terms of differences. Right. Right. I mean, it just something works differently, like some other motive of discipline works better for one than the other. And so that's, I, you know, I apologize that they feel that way. I'm glad you told me. I appreciate you telling me, but and then the end of the conversation. So you, and they can feel that way. <laughs> So then, and it's like that with boys too. Like, my 15 year old will just keep going and going and going. And then finally, we set the limit. The conversation is over, right? If you would like to continue, that here's the next consequence. Don't let me time. Okay, oh, 7.59. You guys have to pick up children. All right, well, thank you very much. Yeah.